Good evening. It is Monday, June 8th. Uh, welcome to the Board of Education meeting. Uh, to begin the meeting, I would uh, like to invite you to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask board members to unmute and then we can say the Pledge of Allegiance together. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, the Republic for which, for which it, stands, it stands, one nation, nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Thank you, everybody. Um, I um, we are about to um, go into the minutes, and we will have um, on the agenda item um, a notice about communications and a few comments about that. I, I do want to know for our viewing public that the Guilford Public Schools administration put out a community letter on June fifth. Um, it can be found on the Guilford Public Schools website under district, then talking with students, then talking to students about racism and intolerance. You also find that Guilford Public Schools has put a number of resources there uh, available to the community. Um, if you have not read that letter, I encourage you to do so. Um, it makes clear Guilford Public Schools stance on um, on race and, um, and, and racial injustice and, and uh, how we as a district uh, feel strongly about uh, those issues. So I encourage you um, to, to avail yourselves of those resources if, if you wish. Um, number three on the agenda is action on minutes. We have a number of minutes um, for meetings held in the last month. The first is for minutes of our regular meeting on May 11th. Is there a motion to accept these minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, second. Mrs. Sullivan seconded. Um, any comments or corrections on the uh, Monday, May 11th meeting minutes? Yes. Um, on page five, under 9.2, on the last line, it should read, would kick in after the district pays for the first $150,000 of a claim, not the 50,000 that's uh, in the current minutes. Right, thank you, yeah. Mr. Sands. Any other corrections? Okay, all in favor of um, approving the minutes from Monday, May 11th? Aye. Say aye. Okay, I saw everyone, so that is a, a unanimous vote to approve those minutes. Uh, next, minutes from the meeting on May 26th, um, workshop meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? I move. Second. Second. I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm getting distracted. Live stream is not working. Okay, in the last minute or? Okay, um, Kevin, we are getting, I'm getting phone calls to my house that the live stream is still not working. So I'm wondering if we could just check that. I, I'm watching it right now. Okay, then we're all set. Thank you, sorry for the interruption. Um, all right, uh, back on track. Uh, action on meeting minutes from May 26th. This was our workshop meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So Mr. Galino. Second. Second, Mrs. Rader. Any corrections? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. The next set of minutes is for Wednesday, May 27th. This was an executive session. Uh, we have two sets of minutes on that date. Um, I'm looking at 3.3, uh, which is a meeting that started at 4.30. Um, uh, those of us in attendance uh, at that meeting can make a motion second and then vote on these. So is there a motion uh, to accept the minutes from the special meeting uh, starting at 4.30 on Wednesday, May 27th? So moved. Uh, second? Second. Dr. Hurst seconded. 
Uh, any corrections? All right, all in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Aye. Uh, Mrs. Rader, sorry, are you uh, agreeing to those minutes as well? Sorry, I'm not seeing everything. Okay, great. So uh, the four people present, four board members present at that meeting um, have approved those minutes. Uh, and lastly, uh, executive session, Wednesday, May 27th, starting at 530. Um, is there a motion to approve these minutes? No. Mrs. Sullivan moved, Mrs. Rader second. Okay. Any corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the four board members who are present have approved those minutes. Um, terrific, thank you. Uh, next on the ag agenda item, typically in our meetings is public forum. Um, please note on the agenda, in lieu of public forum during the meeting, we invite and welcome community members uh, to email us uh, on the agenda. Uh, my email and Dr. Freeman's emails are available. Uh, likewise, any board member's uh, email address is found on the district website. Uh, so again, we have um, received a number of communications in the past week uh, via uh, email um, and, and certainly encourage members to, to use that approach while we are um, doing these remote meetings. Uh, number five on our agenda tonight, review and approval of expenditure for the month of May. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Best um, to take that agenda item. I'm sorry, Mary, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, the expenditures for the month of May were four million eleven thousand eight hundred twenty-one and fifty-six cents. Um, the, the expenditures were 82.48% of the budget as compared to last year in the same month, which was 84.21%. Um, 84 um, so it's a little bit less than the um, budget last year. Um, we're seeing um, uh, some lowering of costs in the salary, supplies, uh, transportation, purchase services lines, all likely due to COVID um, and the fact that we are now at a distance learning um, environment. Um, so we haven't had as much expenses. Um, we did have some revenue in May. Um, that revenue was 274,484 and that was for the excess cost grant um, that we get for special education from the state. Um, total warrants, which we discussed pretty much at length um, in our prior meeting, um, were 1,453,222 and 51 cents. Um, we did discuss, as I said, the warrant specific items um, last meeting and, and folks had a chance to question, but if there's any additional questions, um, we can discuss that now. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Uh, Dr. Bess, is that um, essentially a motion to approve the expenditures for the month of May? Yes, it is. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Sand, second. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor of approving these uh, expenditures? Aye. Aye. Uh, Okay, looks like uh, that's a unanimous vote. Um, thank you, Dr. Best. Uh, next on the agenda is communications. Um, I will note, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Dr. Freeman in a second. I will note that uh, we received approximately, I received and I think most of the board and Dr. Freeman uh, received approximately 40 emails this weekend um, and probably uh, at my last count at about seven, uh, another 35 today um, uh, regarding um, an interest in uh, Guilford Public Schools considering the, um, our present mascot uh, in consideration of uh, concerns that we have um, heard before, but particularly given um, the issues of race and, and racial injustice that are um, part of our uh, kind of national conversation right now, um, given all that is going on. Uh, I will note that um, 
we are receiving these emails from kind of three groups of folks, um, uh, uh, Guilford High School alumni, uh, so graduates um, within the last five or 10 years um, are reaching out to us. We are hearing from present Guilford High School students, um, and we are also hearing from parents in our community. Um, I think I have, um, uh, if I've forgotten anyone else, I, I do know I, I read an email yesterday from a, a younger student, um, not at the high school who is in our system as well, who is concerned about issues um, of our mascot, concerned about uh, the way we um, provide education in our district on issues of race and um, racial injustice. Um, so I, I want to note that uh, uh, in addition, we also received, uh, several of us received phone calls. We've had some discussions with folks over the weekend and today. Um, and uh, uh, certainly I, um, um, we are, are reading each of these um, and, uh, and taking it all in. Um, Dr. Freeman, did you wanna say a comment about this now or during your superintendent's report? Oh, I'd be happy to comment on it now, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree. I think that my count falls somewhere around the mark of 75. Uh, I was responding to some emails um, in between uh, the last meeting that just adjourned and this one as this one began. Um, I think that you have characterized those emails accurately. I think that these are people who are expressing concerns um, about race and racism and systemic racism um, and um, generally the climate and the environment um, instructionally and academically um, around the Guilford Public Schools. And um, in many of the emails that I've received, there are a series of suggestions. Um, oftentimes those suggestions include uh, the changing of the mascot. Uh, they include the completion of a curriculum audit to look to see if, our, if the curricula that we provide are uh, culturally relevant and responsive. Um, there are suggestions that we provide comprehensive training for teachers uh, in the areas of race and race relations and systemic racism and culturally responsive instruction. Um, there are suggestions that we need to be better about ensuring accountability and transparency when issues of racism occur in the school. There is encouragement to hire a more diverse uh, teaching force and administrative team um, and, and at times there is an encouragement um, uh, to, to do this now, not to, not to rely on uh, the closing of schools or the pandemic as an excuse to, to avoid this work. Um, I do wanna note, and I have noted in many of my responses to folks who, who are reaching out through these emails, that m this is work that we had um, attempted to begin this year. And these are conversations that we had begun unpacking um, earlier this school year. Uh, we worked collaboratively uh, with the Madison School System and with the Country School uh, to host an author to talk about issues of race and racism, uh, particularly in affluent, predominantly white communities. Um, our leadership team had read um, both Waking Up White and White Fragility this year. Uh, we have conducted faculty meetings uh, with teachers um, to begin looking at more culturally responsive environments and teaching strategies. Uh, we had begun some curriculum audits, not an overall curricula audit, but looking specifically uh, at literature instruction and titles around literature at the high school level. Um, and then there were other activities that I have to admit were scheduled and canceled post um, March 11th or 12th because of the impacts of the pandemic. Um, on March 11th, in fact, the day that we announced we would be closing schools, uh, we had scheduled a community conversation that was intended to involve representatives uh, from St. Joseph's University, uh, Dr. Don Seidler, who in fact is an expert in culturally responsive instructional uh, techniques and pedagogy, uh, as well as representatives from the Anti-Defamation League uh, and a number of local tribal nations to talk about um, race and racism and the, the, the way that the mascot, our local mascot, fits in, our local high school mascot fits into that. This board had intended to host a public hearing in April 
um, where we were specifically asking the community, to, uh, the broad community, to share their opinions um, about the appropriateness of the Guilford High School mascot, the Indian. Um, and in fact, Dr. Seidler was scheduled to do some work with our instructional coaches um, uh, in May of this year around culturally responsive techniques. Um, I appreciate that recent events make these conversations in Guilford more urgent. Um, and while the pandemic makes them challenging, the, the recent events around the death of George Floyd and the protests that have followed around the country um, make these conversations um, more immediate and, and more important than they may have been some weeks ago. They were always important, but they're, they're more urgent at this time. Um, what I'd like to suggest for the Board of Education, we had talked about scheduling additional special meetings in our off weeks. I think the first step for us is to talk about how to, to, be, to, to re engage with this conversation. Because while the conversation um, around um, race and racism and systemic racism and the way that we teach and learn around those topics in our community uh, are immediately important, we still have to be careful about the structures and the, the, the medical advice. I don't think that we're ready to host an open public forum in our media center um, in a week to, to have large numbers of community members coming out in person and commenting on this topic. Um, I think that we have vehicles like this one, um, but Zoom is difficult when 100 or 300 people begin attending. Um, I think what I'd like to propose is that we schedule another special meeting as we did this past week for this coming Monday, a week from tonight. And I think at that special meeting as a board, we need to talk about the plans for community conversation and the plans for professional learning that we had laid out. And we need to see how those plans need to change in light of both the COVID-19 pandemic and obviously the renewed um, interest and urgency that has come up around this topic of race and racism. I do wanna point out that, that of the many emails that I've read over these last few days, the stories of the recent graduates who talk about going away to university proud to wear their Guilford Indian hats, jerseys, and sweatshirts, and then quickly find themselves uncomfortable about wearing those articles um, in a different setting um, have really struck home with me. And I think that we as a community need to discuss that. Um, I think we as a board need to figure out how to provide the appropriate vehicles for people to safely express their opinions so that we as a leadership team can then continue to do the work. And I will go back to the communication that Dr. Balistracy referenced that we sent out. This needs to be more than a conversation and a call to action. It needs to be concrete action. And, and I wanna make it clear that, that we're not talking about stalling or delaying, um, but we need to make sure that everybody feels comfortable and safe and heard in whatever, in whatever way we choose to, choose to shape that conversation. We did not have an item on tonight's agenda to be discussing these items. While I have a sense that there are people who are watching the YouTube channel because of this topic, I know that there are others who would be surprised and disappointed if we wade into this conversation tonight without having advertised the conversation. I think next Monday, we can post an agenda, we can include this topic specifically and overtly on that agenda, and we can make sure that people who want to um, at least observe, if not actively participate in that conversation, have the opportunity to do so. And then I think it's incumbent upon us to find a way to make sure that people who want to participate can do so safely and comfortably. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. I, I do wanna underscore um, one of the things you said for the viewing public. Um, we are required by state statute as a board of education to post our agendas in a certain amount of time. Um, and so to add a really important topic like this last minute is um, inappropriate because there are community members who would want to partake in this discussion and or hear the Board of Ed um, uh, talking about this discussion who 
do not would not know it was happening. Um, so it, it is really uh, we are not lost on the sense of urgency we are hearing in these letters and uh, and on these phone calls. Um, the, the problem really is that um, with respect to members of the community, we want to make sure that the community knows when we are talking about it um, so that they can be um, part of uh, listening and partaking in that discussion. Um, I, I hope that those of you who have reached out by email or by phone um, have uh, received our responses. We are um, uh, picking up the phone and uh, uh, replying to emails as quickly as we can, um, recognizing what an important issue this is. And um, I will also say that uh, as a member of this Board of Education for eight and a half years, there are many times where we have had to make decisions um, in which we get very little public input. So um, to have the public speak to us and tell us how they're feeling uh, makes our jobs uh, much more informed. Uh, so I um, always appreciate when the public um, makes sure that uh, they, they reach out to us. Um, okay, so uh, an extremely important topic. Um, we will be uh, quickly trying to identify um, our next steps in terms of meetings so that the public is aware of how this conversation will quickly unfold. Dr. Freeman, Dr. were you about to add something? Yeah, if I may, I did want to reiterate a point that you had already made, but it's important enough that I want to, to highlight that. I also would like to encourage members of our community to visit the Guilford Public Schools website. There are resources that we are compiling on the website. Um, for, there, there are communications that have gone out from uh, the leadership team in whole. I know that principals are communicating out to teachers and to parents and to students directly in their schools around these topics. And we are compiling a variety of resources, a number of different um, links that you can use, um, TED Talks that you can watch. There is a town hall held um, on Sesame Street talking about racism and protests and, and is very appropriate for younger students to talk about these topics. Um, I really want to encourage everybody to look for communications coming from your individual schools and to go to the website to look for the resources that we do have available. Wonderful. Um, I, I will note that the next item in, in the agenda is student representatives. Um, they um, have been with us all year. Um, I, I don't um, know that they will be on um, our meetings as we move forward, as it is the end of the year. Um, so as they give their reports, um, I welcome them to, um, to add something on this topic for us to think about if they wish, no pressure. Um, the rest of the board is really not in a position to talk about this um, issue and debate it tonight. Um, but uh, your voices in terms of the decisions that we have to make are really important ones and you have provided us with uh, valuable information over the year. Um, so I am, I, item number seven, gonna turn to our student representatives um, who will provide us with, um, with updates on the schools. Um, I don't know what order you wanna go in. I welcome, um, welcome either of you to go first. Um, I can start off. Um, I am woefully unprepared to give any reports on our schools because I wasn't expecting to, um, but I would like to comment on the issues of race and racism that we've been talking a lot about in the past few weeks. Um, number one, I think it's really important for us to at least start the conversations or continue them of changing the mascot of our school. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that using a using a entire culture as our mascot is not exactly appropriate anymore. Um, it may have been when we originally decided to make it our mascot. I read a little bit about the history and it was originally meant to honor our native tribes, but now it doesn't, it's not really seeming like that anymore. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize that while people are not, while a lot of the people in the high school are not very aware of this issue, 
um, and they may not be constantly fighting for it, I think it is important to try to make this change. Um, in addition to the mascot, um, things like the curriculum, I believe also need to have some modifications. Um, I know, like Dr. Freeman said, we have started to make some changes, especially in the English curriculum with trying to get more um, sources from people of color, especially women of color, considering that's the lowest um, lowest group. We have the fewest number of female black authors in our curriculum. Um, so I think it's really important that all of our different types of people and cultures are represented in the curriculum. Um, what else? There's the curriculum. Um, also um, trying to hire more people of color as faculty is also important because while Guilford is somewhat of a cultural bubble, um, we, we do have many more white people than any other race. I think trying to diversify as much as possible will make it easier for us to address our own issues with race, such as internalized racism. Thank you, Abby. Um, thank and, you, Abby. And thanks so much. Um, uh, my apologies to the student reps uh, putting you on the spot. I, I, um, I'm recognizing as I look the agenda that um, we have you here for a, for a couple of reasons and, um, and you were not expected to report tonight on um, ongoing remote issues. So that is on me. Um, uh, I don't, I don't want to put anyone on, else on the spot, but, um, but if uh, any of the other students on the phone would like to say a word on this topic, because we won't have you uh, necessarily um, in the meetings moving forward as the school year finishes, I, I offer the opportunity, um, but that is not pressure. Um, so yeah, I very much agree with what Abby said, especially about the issue with the mascot. And I think right now this is a issue that's very like very torn in our school. Like it's very much half and half. Like there's people who strongly oppose it, and then there's people who also really want it to stay. But I still think this is a this is something that we should like moving forward try to change into something that's more like politically correct, I guess. And additionally, for like a just school in general, I don't have like the middle schools to report on either. But things are starting to like come to a come to an end at the high school, and I think teachers are doing a good job of like incorporating things we've done throughout the year into a more like creative, relaxed final sort of project, because there aren't really like final exams this year. So yeah, so I think about all this. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for your comments tonight, um, uh, and um, as we come to the close of an academic year. Um, uh, I want to thank all our student reps for um, for their reports every month and for really feeding us back um, really helpful and valuable information as uh, representatives of the student body. Um, I will note then that um, agenda item 7.1 is the recognition of student representatives on the board. Dr. Freeman, am I turning this over to you or to, or to Mr. Macenti? Who's, um, who's is this? So I think I actually, go ahead, Rick. Uh, no, uh, we have the CABE Awards and then uh, the recognition of Abby. Right, right. Would you like to speak to those, Mr. Macenti? Are you prepared to speak to the CABE Awards? I'm prepared to speak uh, to the CABE Awards and to Abby, too, uh, for would, last year. I, I am happy to turn this over to you for the, the last time that you're going to be rep recognizing students in one of these settings. Thanks, Dr. Freeman. I, I'll tell you this, um, all I had to do is listen to Abby and, uh, you know, she represents uh, some tremendous students in our, our high school. And um, I think you've all read the 70 something emails. I have to tell you, as sad a topic as it is that's being discussed over these emails and, you know, how much work we have ahead of us um, to see the names of kids that graduated 10, 12 years ago and what they're doing um, and how involved they are uh, in, 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 in just making people better and making life better. That's, 
that's what I, that's that's what's unique about this town. Um, you know, just very powerful young people who go on to make sure that uh, they can make contributions to our society anyway. And Abby, what you just said just kind of mirrored all that. And uh, George Washington University just got better. Uh, but Abby's a senior and we're gonna miss her after this year. And I'm gonna move into the Cave Awards because uh, not only does the Cave Awards recognize uh, young people who do excellent jobs in the classroom, but uh, it's also in the community as well and to their fellow students. And Abby's part of our IB diploma program. So she's taken that international mind in this, as you can see, and is really gonna take it to another level, I'm sure next year. I'm glad Mrs. Chaff is with us this evening too, because I know how much uh, work she's put into the IB program and, and uh, she's smiling now because she knows the quality of students uh, that, that Abby represents. The Abby's a member of National Honor Society, the National French Honor Society, um, and that might all look good on a resume, and, and, it's, and it is about scholastic achievement, but it's also about service above self. She has traveled on numerous mission trips uh, along the eastern seaboard um, to help uh, people in need, and that speaks uh, volumes for her character. She's stage manager for our awards-winning theater arts program, and if you've seen our productions, which I know you all have, it is a massive task that she undertakes, um, and, and in her leadership role, uh, she performs it flawlessly. And as I said, she'll be attending George Washington University next year. She's going to major in either biology or public health uh, with a pre-med track is what she really wants to follow. So Abby, congratulations. Very, very proud of you. Looking forward to uh, you coming across that stage uh, for graduation. Nice job. Thank you. Andy. And tell your father, you know, to buy you a car. So that's it. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Abby. Thank you. Thank you. And our next student, uh, Ellie Weisler. I think Ellie's on on, on with us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she is yes, another, Ellie's here. She, she's another super senior and um, a member of National Honor Society, Spanish Honor Society. But uh, you talk about somebody who usually takes the bull by the horns and gets it done herself. Uh, this is this young lady. I, I can't wait to see uh, what happens when she uh, matriculates to the, the next level. Uh, member of Spanish Honor Society, as I said, National Honor Society, but she's founder and president of TED Ed Student Talks. And uh, the superintendent is huge on providing his TED Talks uh, throughout the year. Well, she's taken it to her own level with the student uh, TED Talks. And, um, and so she holds forums uh, routinely with young people uh, to discuss those kinds of talks. She's founder and president of the Science Olympiad team. She's co-president of the Girls Who Code. She is co-president of Women in Science. Uh, she is first tenor saxophone for our wind ensemble. She's all state and saxophone as well. Um, she's a, a part of the all regional band. I mean, I don't know how she does it in the classroom, outside the classroom, and then in the community as well. She's done her internship, um, a couple of internships, in fact, at Yale School of Medicine. And uh, she'll be attending Harvard next year. And she will, um, she wants to uh, take some coursework that moves her in the direction of becoming a uh, physician scientist. And uh, these are two young ladies that uh, uh, just they best exemplify the young people that walk the halls at our high school. And again, just to see the 70 something letters that have come across my emails over the last few days and to see what our graduates have gone on to become and what they've been writing about just validates what they've become. These two ladies are on the same track. Uh, you know, they're, they're incredible people. Oh, oh, we are, Ellie. Uh, we, oh, sorry. Just want to nope, clap nope, for Ellie as well. Congratulations. We are, we are proud to present these two students tonight as this year's CABE honorees. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, we are excited to watch where you go next. Uh, uh, I have to uh, echo uh, Mr. Macenti's comments. Uh, reading these letters from uh, from graduates and hearing the different things they're doing is is really, really fun and exciting. Um, hearing their messages is really important. Um, so I certainly welcome you to fill us in um, as you move forward. It would be great to, to hear. And then additionally, tonight is Abby's last official meeting as a representative to this Board of Education. And so we want to thank her for all of her time and her commitment to keeping us um, connected to students and apprised of student perspectives uh, throughout this course year. So Abby, again, thank you for everything that you've done um, in, in that role as well. 
<laughs> and Jerry, you'll be coming back and joining us again next year in this role. We're looking forward to having you back and thank you for everything that you've done this year. Thank you. Yes, th thank you all. And, and I really, um, uh, uh, I want to echo again my my thanks to our student reps for um, for being really uh, uh, valuable um, parts of this board and uh, and Jerry we 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 uh, we can't wait to to have you back next year continuing to uh, to keep us informed. Um, my best to all three of you for the the summer um, uh, to Abby and uh, Ellie uh, as you. Uh, go on to your next journey next year. We really wish you all the best. Um, you are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. Um, you are also welcome um, to, to, to go off uh, go offline here if, if you so choose. Uh, but thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Good. Thank you. All right. Uh, number eight, superintendent's report, Dr. Freeman. Yes, so first we are happy to be able to update this board and the community to some uh, changes and revisions to our plans for the graduation ceremony, which will be held next week on June 17th, as Wednesday evening, June 17th. Um, as this board is aware, uh, we had initially uh, released a plan for graduation that we felt was um, thoughtful and um, conservative uh, and followed the guidelines that the state had put out um, around um, public gatherings. Uh, this board knows that when we issued that plan, uh, we began to receive a significant amount of feedback from the community. Um, and, and the majority of the feedback that we received um, was that the plan might be more conservative than was necessary given changing guidelines and the releasing of some guidelines that has been occurring over the last several weeks in Connecticut um, and that it did not make the, the graduation this year um, as special as it could be, that maybe we had erred on the side of, of conservatism. Uh, I wanna say that I'm enormously proud of how the high school leadership team responded to that feedback um, because the first thing that they did was that they scrambled a number of meetings with seniors at the high school. Uh, Zoom invitations went out. I know that every senior at the high school was participated to be part of those conversations. Um, and I think Mr. Macenti ended up speaking to in the ballpark 80 or 100 students um, and asked what they were looking for in their graduation. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, we met again with local health officials and with local police officials. And at the same time, we did in fact see some loosening of the strictures around public gatherings. And so what had been planned as a drive-in theater tent where students were in one location, um, but completely isolated in their cars for the entire event, has now become a drive-in event that will happen earlier in the evening. Um, and rather than being together to watch a pre-recorded graduation ceremony, we will be together to watch a live graduation ceremony. Speakers will be speaking live from a stage rather than from a pre-recorded screen. And of particular note, and it was the most important thing that Mr. Macenti and his team heard when they spoke to the seniors. It was the most important piece that we had missed in our original design. The students will have the opportunity to exit their vehicles in small groups of 20 at a time and then have their names called and they will be able to walk across the stage in real time to receive, um, not their actual diploma, but they receive their diploma cover. And that's the way that we've always done it at graduation. They will have the opportunity to um, progress across the stage and to beard and to have a professional photograph taken of their graduation moment. Um, that event at the fairgrounds will be preceded um, by a car procession. While the seniors will not be able to walk in procession from behind St. George's and across the green, they will be in their cars with police escort from the Guilford High School to the grounds prior to that event. Um, it is important to note that it will still be a car-based event. Families will still be in a car. The cars will be parked at safe distance 
from each other. And it's important to note that the cars are being used as isolating um, devices. This allows us to um, have all approximately 1,000 individuals together, approximately 280 graduates um, with their family guests, um, but by staying in our cars rather than sitting in lawn chairs together, um, we can be together, we can meet um, all of the guidelines that have been set, and we can have both a safe and healthy event and an in-person and, and personal event. So again, uh, I want to thank the community members who gave us their feedback. I want to thank the seniors who met with uh, Mr. Masenti and Mrs. Podlinski to give their feedback. And I really want to applaud the high school leadership team and graduation team um, who made those changes and were able to make the event more special for our students. Um, I do want to note um, there has been further opportunity given um, to delay graduation. Um, I know that there have been questions about why we're not delaying graduation into July or August when gatherings would allow for groups as large as 150 to gather. Um, that was discussed with the students. Uh, that was something that we looked into um, pretty significantly. Um, and our big concern there is twofold. One, some of our students will miss. We have students who have um, early arrival to universities or they are enlisting in the military or they have other summer obligations which would make them unavailable to attend an event if we did an event later in the summer. And even at 150, if we hosted a graduation for the seniors only with no guests, we would have to run a minimum of two ceremonies. The students would not all be together, they would be split in half to recognize this moment. And if we allowed students to bring even one or two guests with them, we would be running multiple ceremonies where students would not be together. The second most important thing that they shared with Mr. Masenti and his team was their desire to be together in one place and in one time. So again, um, I'm glad that people spoke up and gave the feedback. I'm glad that we've had a slightly opening of, opening of the window that allows us to have groups of 20 students rather than no students allowed to step out of the cars. Um, and uh, I'm glad that the team looked at the plans and made some changes to the plan. Um, I think that this is um, safe. I think that it will be healthy. And I think that it is more appro appropriate to the importance of the moment. Uh, and I applaud everybody who put time into both designing the plan and then revising to this new plan that we released to the families on Friday, I believe. Um, I, I glossed over this, but after speaking to the students and after revisiting the plans, um, the high school team put together three distinct options. One was the original plan we had shared. Uh, one was a bit of a hybrid plan. And the final one was option three that I just detailed for all of you. Uh, over 190 students voted um, and option number three that I described to you was the overwhelming choice. More than 85% of the students who participated in that survey requested that we, um, we um, use option number three for our event on June 17th, and that's what we will do. Um, I don't know if Mr. Masenti and Mrs. Chaff are still on, it looks like they've stepped away. So I was gonna ask them if I've missed anything. Oh, Mrs. Chaff is still here. Um, I don't know if I missed anything in that overview. Is there anything that I failed to include in that? Um, the I, only, uh, there will be an, uh, I'm sorry, Julia. I said, I think that was pretty comprehensive. <clears throat> but we're happy to answer questions if you have any questions about the graduation event. Well, I have a quick question to ask regarding the, uh, the live stream. Will it be actually live, A, and for uh, participants that cannot attend, they'll be able, they'll get an, a, a link, or how will we communicate that, that link out to non, the people who can't get into the same car? That is a great question. Thank you for remembering that. Um, yes, there will be a live stream of the event, and we will have information out. I believe that there will be multiple oper multiple ways to access that live streaming event. So we're still working on some of how that will be pushed out. Um, I do believe that while it is live, it is on a delay. So um, I am a little concerned um, for folks who may want to be um, both watching the stage and monitoring the live stream from uh, a, a screen in the 
car, that may be a little hard to follow if there is a 10 second delay. I do believe there's a 10 second delay built into the live stream. Um, but anybody who is either uncomfortable attending the event because of health or safety concerns, they can participate or, or watch through the live stream. And we know that a car may not fit all of the family members who want to participate with any individual senior. So anybody who cannot attend can watch the live streaming event. Um, I believe we're working on uh, access through GCTV, as well as through Zoom itself, as well as through um, YouTube, but we're working on the, we'll finalize those and get all that information out. Dr. Freeman, for, for students who, um, who can't or choose not to attend for health and safety concerns that may be personal to them, how we will read their names, how will we make sure we are honoring their graduation, even if they are not um, walking across the stage at this event? So, yep, their name will be read at the event, even if they're not um, they're present, able to walk across the stage. We are working on the ability during the live stream to be able to insert their photograph in at the appropriate time so that um, they will be part of the broadcast, even if they cannot walk physically across the stage. And then, as I mentioned, um, historically at graduation, we provide the um, diploma covers. Students will actually be picking up their individual diplomas at the high school by appointment on the 17th. And so for those students who cannot make it or are unable to be there, uh, we can work on an individual arrangement and, and have an individual delivery um, in cap and gown if that is something that, that the family would like to have uh, arranged for them. Other questions, anybody, other thoughts? All right, um, terrific. Um, the next item, end of school year update. Yeah, so I just wanted to note there that as we do begin to, well, this we enter our last full week of school today. Uh, we have a few days into the following week and this, as the school year winds down, I do want to remind um, parents who are watching tonight to make sure that you are following carefully uh, communications coming out of your individual school. There are closeout procedures that are being communicated from the schools out to parents, both opportunities for students to return to the schools to pick up any personal belongings uh, that may have been left, as well as particularly at the older grades, um, scheduled opportunities for students to come back to school to return um, textbooks and school materials and other items that do need to be returned to the schools. Chrome books, we will be allowing to remain home over the summer with students who have them at, um, now so that they can continue to access those Chromebooks and continue to engage in learning pursuits across the summer, whether those are independent or whether that is accessing supplemental materials that we have provided, or whether that means students who may choose to opt into some of the summer opportunities that we are putting together and preparing to offer. Um, seniors will be returning their Chromebooks. All other students will be able to hold on to those. Um, so again, I want to encourage parents to, to watch carefully for communications that are coming out of the individual schools. I also just want to reiterate for the community um, how we will be closing out the school year when it comes to progress monitoring and grading of the students. Um, in all of our communications dating back to March, as we went into this um, school closing in response to the pandemic, we have tried to communicate clearly um, that our greatest concern is for the health and well being of our students. Um, um, and that is paramount even over and above um, instruction and learning. We know that maintaining contact with teachers was more important than the content that we were covering. Um, and we knew that the relationships um, main, being maintained across this time uh, were more important and relationships are essential to learning and more important than maybe the rigor of the activities that we were engaging in. Um, to honor that and to actually uphold our end of, of that bargain when we, when we communicated those concerns out, we have made it clear um, that at the elementary level, as we report on student progress, we want parents to remember 
that much of the reporting of the progress that students have made um, is about this moment in time. And it's about the interruption to the regular school year. And parents um, need to be reminded and, and need, to re need to remember that if a student, if a, if a teacher reports to you that your child may need a little bit more time to achieve a third grade standard, that is more about the interruption to the school year than it is about your child. And to remember that that is progress notes. It is not um, commentary on, on student ability or potential. And it's not grades that we issue at the elementary school. It's notes that we use to let you know how the year went and what we will and, and how we will begin the following year. Um, at the middle schools, uh, we will not be issuing letter grades as we do traditionally and as we did for the first three quarters of this school year. Um, students will be receiving indications of whether they um, achieved passing or are still at an incomplete status for this fourth quarter. And students will have um, summer opportunities as well as all of the first quarter of next year to complete any work um, or meet any standards that they may not have completed as this year has come to closure. Um, and at the high school level, for any students taking high school level courses, students and their families have the option of choosing to accept a letter grade based on the work that was completed across this last quarter, or to also receive an, an indication of passing or incomplete status. And again, high school students will have through the first quarter of next year to complete any incomplete work at this time. Um, we are enormously concerned about student learning that has occurred across this last quarter. We are less concerned about the grades that students are being issued in this last quarter. Grades are not what's important here. What's important is that students remain engaged, that they stayed in touch with us, and that they continued learning and continued momentum moving forward in and around their own learning. Um, we spoke with multiple college admissions offices. Um, we have looked at what it means for transcripts and, and grade point averages. Um, and we're enormously proud of the position we took around grading and the way that we are looking to close out this particular school year. Um, um, and we, we put school year 1920 behind us. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer questions there before I move on to the next item, which is reopening of schools uh, for school year 2021. Um, and that will be the shortest piece of, of my report this evening. So what I do want to what I do want to report then around the opening of school year 2021 is that while we are working as a leadership team to begin making plans for next year, um, we are continuing to work on multiple plans for next year because we're continuing to await decisions and guidance um, from the State Department of Education about about the about the restrictions or the guidelines or the expectations for next year. Um, I received multiple um, questions today from parents asking what the plans for September are. And, and to, to be completely honest, the answer at this moment is that we still don't know. Um, right now, Hartford is working on multiple options for what next year looks like. What I do know is I do not believe that we will be opening schools in late August or September um, in a way that looks traditional. Um, right now, Hartford is, is working on plans that will be reducing the physical capacity in schools in September. We are not expecting to have classes of 20 students. We're not looking to serve large lunch waves of 350 students. We're not even sure um, how many students we will be able to accommodate on individual bus runs. We are looking at a year next year that will in some way um, be a hybrid of in physical, you know, physical in-person schooling and some continuation of distance learning. It's likely that that will be different for our youngest students than it is for our older students. Um, but at this time, I cannot be more specific or detailed about what that will look like because we're still awaiting that guidance. And so whether it means, um, uh, a, some kind of rotating calendar of students who are coming to school or, or continuing to access learning from home. 
uh, whether it means half days of in-person schooling uh, with additional um, extended project period or expectations or homework expectations that are supported at home through the technology and distance learning platforms that we've worked with, or whether it is something else, um, I simply don't know right now. Um, and nobody around the state um, has that answer just yet. So um, I, need, I need the Guilford Schools community to know that we're um, pushing to get those answers and to get those clarifications. Um, and that we will um, have a plan and communicate that plan as quickly as, as we can responsibly put that together. Paul, are you getting any sense at all from the state about um, whether there's gonna be some local control over sort of the finer details of this or is it too early to even? It's too early to tell. I know that um, I know that the preference in Hartford is to try to give guidelines and to try to mark out what the expectations are and then allow some degree of local decision making within those guidelines. Um, I think that um, this particular decision is so big and of so much import and I you know, it's, it's bigger than, than the closing because it, when we first closed, we thought we'd only be closed for two or four weeks. Um, and even when we determined it was going to go longer, we knew that it was for the end of a school year. Um, this is bigger than the guidelines and the flexibilities that were offered around graduation or summer school. Um, so I don't know if it will be um, more, um, more strict and more... Um, um, consistent across, across the state. Um, I think that it is questions like that that are leading to the delays in, in releasing that, that sort of guidance. Dr. Freeman, can you touch upon what ESY is gonna look like for the summer? Uh, yes, so the extended school year opportunities um, and when we, talk about, when we talk about extended school year, we're really talking about um, probably three distinct things. Um, there are often summer opportunities that we offer to, um, to our, our broad population. And those are students um, who choose to be part of uh, summer learning camps that we offer. And often they're built around um, topics like math instruction or engineering or, or even architecture um, we touched on. There is then um, generally um, extended school year services that are provided to students who are um, identified as needing special educational supports. And that is often the extension of the individual educational plan through the summer. Um, and then finally, there are opportunities that happen in our schools, although they are not directly supervised by the school system. Um, and that would be things like park and rec camps that take place in our buildings, although they're supervised by the park and recs department and the before and after um, uh, uh, care opportunities that are offered. Um, and those are offered through the Guilford before and after school care um, organization. Again, partnering with us, but distinct from us. Um, those opportunities, the learning camps that we offer this year, we are excited about offering. We believe that we will have eight different offerings and those in fact will continue to be distance learning opportunities. We're looking at having eight different offerings um, spread across different grade brands from K through eighth grade. Um, and what we're most excited about there is that from the student perspective, these are, um, these are content integrations. They bring together multiple subject areas, not single subject areas for students to begin exploring projects that bring multiple learning, um, um, different subjects and different learning opportunities to bear. What we're very excited about is that they're being designed to both take what we've learned from these 12 weeks of distance learning um, and tell us more about what we can do next year. Whenever we offer these summer learning camps, we always use them as learning labs to learn both, um, to provide learning for the students and opportunities for the students but to learn about teaching instruction ourselves. And so this year in particular, uh, we are looking to really sharpen what we've learned about distance learning and come back knowing more because whatever happens in September, I believe there will be a distance component to that. 
um, the extended school year program will be a hybrid. We will be offering, again, some in-person, in-school opportunities, but much of, the, um, much of the extended school year programming will remain um, distance in nature. Um, the guidelines around summer school um, limit the number of students that we can have in spaces, limit the number of students that we can transport on school buses, uh, they require masks in the schools, they require increased um, number of adults available, and part of what we're finding um, is that um, this is still early in the reopening, it is an early phase of reopening, and we're finding that there are still some students and parents and teachers who are not feeling completely ready to return to schools um, um, this soon. We're also recognizing that to meet the guidelines established um, by the State Department of Education would dramatically increase the expense of the summer school program, and we've not budgeted for those increased expenses. We weren't anticipating um, needing to reduce class sizes to almost half of what we normally budget for, um, therefore almost needing to double the number of staff members coming on board. Um, we're finding a number of staff members um, who are uh, willing and, and available to, to work in the distance programming, um, but less so feeling ready to come into the buildings and, and work in those structures. The um, park and rec and the daycare programming will continue to be offered. Again, those are happening in the schools, although not delivered by the school system. They have less stringent um, guidelines uh, than the school program would have and we're still working with park and rec and before and after care and do believe that those will be occurring this year although in smaller um, groupings than they have in the past and distributed more broadly around the school system um, the guidance around summer school we received last week officially so again this is all developing very quickly um, i do not envy uh, the folks at the State Department of Education and in the governor's office having to put out reopening guidance that they feel is safe and responsible, um, but it is putting us very much behind the eight ball in planning and trying to quickly um, roll out these decisions in these programs um, as soon as we have access to that information. That was a really Mr. long Freeman. answer. <laughs> Dr. Freeman, I, you know, I, I've mentioned this before, but I, I'm going to mention it again. You know, um, a lot when we when when we were talking about graduation, when we're talking about extended school year, when we're talking about reopening in the fall, um, you know, we talk a lot. We hear a lot about waiting for for what the state um, is going to determine, and and uh, so frequently, um, whether again it's even the extended school year, but certainly the different things we hear bouncing around about the fall. Um, the 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 financial implications of these things, um, some of them seem really uh, non feasible, and you know my question is, do you have a sense of what extent? I, I'm sure they're they're uh, thinking about this all very carefully, but the the state department is hearing from superintendents or hearing from boards of ed um, instead of having us just wait, but hearing. Yes. Um, that that you know um, that we're going to need plans that are feasible. Yes, I mean so in in addition to juggling the demands of this pandemic and trying to figure out how schools can be safe locations for students in any number in September. Um, whatever comes out as medical guidance around how to structure schools to be physically safe in September, then absolutely comes with a price tag. And that price tag is landing on that local school district and community in a time where we're also experiencing a financial crisis. And so we have been enormously fortunate in Guilford that the budget um, that we requested, that this board requested for next year was reduced, but was reduced fairly minimally um, by this Board of Finance in recognition of those costs. There are other communities around the state that will have greater costs next year and have had their budgets significantly reduced. And so um, again, Hartford, I, I have every confidence is working as fast as they can possibly work, um, but ultimately they will give us guidelines 
Well, they will give us rules around around numbers and loading and, and mm -hmm. how students will be expected to move safely to and from and in and around our schools. Once we have those guidelines, they will then issue some guidance and suggestions around how they think that we can then meet the students' academic and emotional needs within those settings. And then the price tag of that, we will have to figure out how to absorb within the actual budget that has been approved for these schools next year. So, so the one thing that we, we know is a certainty is our budget for next year. We don't know yeah. how, how far those dollars will go to meet first the medical needs and then the academic and emotional needs of the students that we will try to serve. Just as a point of reference, if we were to, if we were to bring all of our students in for a full 180 day school year and meet the PP, PPE guidelines that the state had set out for us, we know that that's a minimum cost of an additional quarter million dollars that we had not budgeted. Uh, there's a lot of ways to look at that. A quarter million dollars is equivalent to five teacher salaries. Um, if we were to fully load the buildings every day for 180 days and meet the suggested PPE usage, um, we would have to figure out how to, how to provide an additional quarter million dollars worth of supplies. Um, and again, that's just, that's just a physical need to meet that medical expectation. That doesn't speak to increased transportation costs that we may we may um, run into and it doesn't speak to people's um, readiness to to return to a school system and learn comfortably if if you're nervous about being there or if your parents are uncomfortable having you there and so again I do think there will be some degree of of, of a hybrid between in-person opportunities um, that may be smaller and less frequent than we have been used to in the past um, offset by some continuation of, of what the, the distance learning platform has come to look like over these last 12 weeks, um, informed um, by a parent survey that we issued some weeks ago that we intend to reissue um, this coming week, um, by focus groups that Dr. Crystal and I plan on scheduling in the near future uh, for parent groups and for teacher groups and for student groups. Um, and, 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 you know, again, meeting those almost competing needs um, around what's right medically and what do we know kids need instructionally and emotionally come September. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. Freeman, um, along the lines of what uh, Dr. Balistracy said about uh, seeing if the state can produce some guidance that we could actually implement, one of the things that concerns me is that I have heard rumors that to provide social distancing on the buses, we would have to download the buses very significantly. And the question that I'm worried about is if we're doing this, a, a lot of the districts in the state are gonna be doing this is our bus company going to be able to provide enough buses? Um, that's a worry. That's a legitimate worry. If, if every school system in the state of Connecticut, um, right, and we know that our buses are never filled to capacity. We know that a bus could seat 60 to 70 students depending on age. Due to the length of our runs and the geographic size of our community, we usually load buses in the area of 20 or 30. But if we need to reduce that to say 10 students per bus, and we need, and if every district in the state needs to triple or quadruple the number of buses that they have on the road, then the quick answer is no. As a state, there are not enough buses or drivers available for everybody to meet that need. Now, I, I know that one response to that is that, um, in, in many communities, parents will choose to drive their students. And so 
we may have, um, and that's going to create different concerns. We've tried really hard to encourage parents in Guilford not to drive their students to school because that exacerbates the traffic problems and the loading problems and starting school on time. Um, but to some degree, um, the response at the state level has been there will be less demand on the public bus service that is being provided um, because parents will, will feel more comfortable and it will be more convenient to have more students driven to school at, rather than riding the public bus. Um, but again, does, does that mean that the state would give us a waiver uh, on the requirement that we provide a seat for every student? I mean, we we've got for example at the high school we have a large number of students who drive themselves to the high school but we have to schedule the high school buses as if every one of those kids was going to get picked up so i think the quick answer ted is that no i don't think so and i think and again the way that well and i i can again I'm speculating, so one, please know that this is rank speculation on my part. But when we looked at that formula in the past, we do it as a formula. So we know that 100% of the students at the high school don't ride the buses. It's actually more like 50%. So while we schedule our buses to drive through every neighborhood and within walking distance to every bus, Every, there is a bus stop with an appropriate walking distance to every high school house in the Guilford community. But we know that on no one day will 100% of the students show up to get on those buses. If they did, the system wouldn't work. It is, a, it is a statistical analysis that we do. And we know that no single bus is ever going to be overloaded because only, I think what the state is suggesting is that next year, rather than assuming that 50% of our high school students ride the bus, we should actually assume that only 25 or 30% of the students are going to ride the bus. But I do not think the state will ever allow us to say to a student, if you need a ride to school today, that it's unavailable to you. We would never be able to schedule the buses, I believe, in such a way that there isn't a bus stop within walking distance of every home. We okay. may get a little bit of latitude that says there's a 30 day window for a family to inform you of such need and you have to then reconfigure to meet that need. Right now, the expectation is the bus has to be there every day and a family doesn't need to inform you that tomorrow they want to ride the bus, that bus has to be there um, for them whether they've, whether they've made you aware in advance or not. And again, um, there's a lot of conversation and work that's going into uh, what that's going to look like. It again leads to the idea that there might be some combination of uh, this hybrid where only half the students are coming in on any given day and therefore you do have more bus capacity to move just half of your population at a lower load on the school buses rather than moving the whole population. But what that day on day off week on week off or half day schedule looks like again we still don't know and i don't know if we'll be given a, a slate of options to choose from locally um, as we were with graduation when the graduation guidelines came out there was a list of bottom line expectations you needed to meet and then there were three templated suggestions for what that might look like um, I, we, we still we simply don't know Okay. It's worth pointing out, I never imagined I'd be sitting in a, uh, a June Board of Education meeting letting you know that we don't know what September is going to look like. It's simply not a moment that I ever imagined in my, in my career. Oh, yeah. We all have to be flexible. It's going to be a it's going to be a busy and it's going to be an interesting summer putting these plans together and then communicating these plans with with our community and supporting our community as they come to terms. But these plans will have impacts on families. Right, oh, distance yeah. learning had a significant yeah. impact on on what we expect of families Monday through Friday between seven thirty and four. Um, this plan will continue. To have to have those sorts of family impacts. 
You know, I, I am very glad to hear um, that you're going to resend the survey out to parents at this time. I think um, that that's a great idea. Um, I, I'd be fascinated to see um, the ch possible changes, in, you know, in that survey. And I think it's, um, you know, a good good step to take, you know, as you're making your as you're making your plans. Yep, we're going to want to make sure that we recognize how people felt about distance learning and what they felt was working four weeks ago and what they feel in this last week of school. I, we recognize that 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 perception will have evolved um, over that time. Um, and we think that it's very important to have a number of focus groups. Um, surveys are valuable because they get a lot of people, but, it's, but, but to sit and talk with a smaller group is something that we will be planning moving forward as well. Uh, and we're looking to do probably a group of elementary parents that are representative, a group of middle, par middle level parents, high school parents. Uh, we're looking to have a representative teacher conversation and we're looking to meet with students from definitely the high school, if not both the high school and middle levels to have conversations about um, what worked and what could be different. And again, um, using this summer opportunity as a way to try to refine some of that pedagogy as, as well. Any other thoughts? All right, well, uh, Dr. Freeman, thank you so much for that update. Um, we will be, um, the Board of Ed will be um, and has added meetings to our schedule over the next several months as um, as plans unfold so that we can be uh, regularly involved in these conversations as we start getting concrete information um, from the state. Yeah, and, and I, I would like to, again, and we can, um, we can certainly post this moving forward, but I do think that to schedule another special meeting as we had last week for Monday um, to continue the COVID updates and hopefully we'll have more information about reopening um, but also the, um, for next week's meeting uh, to have conversation about how do we come back to the conversation that we were trying to, to engage in this year around race and racism right. in, in our school Absolutely. system. How do we come back to it during this pandemic and how do we come back to it during um, this moment of civic unrest? Because I think both of them have impacted mm -hmm. um, both the process and the content of that conversation and the decisions that we need to have, uh, we need to make and the actions that we need to take here as a school system. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, uh, we are now um, at the point of the meeting of the board agenda. Uh, 9.1 is to act on personnel items. Um, so um, the first, uh, please ratify the resignation for the purpose of retirement of the following teachers. Uh, Aurora Caneco, Guilford High School, Spanish, 24 years of service to Guilford. And Sharon Jacobson, Guilford High School, um, also Spanish and the World Language Department Chair, 50 years of service um, in Guilford. Certainly uh, uh, two people have given a tremendous, tremendous <laughs> amount of time um, and energy to our school system and our students. Um, please, uh, Dr. Freeman, please extend our uh, sincere appreciation uh, to both of these women. I absolutely will. These are gonna be two positions that are going to, um, well, they're gonna be two positions that are difficult to fill. They're gonna be two individuals who are impossible to replace. Um, uh, Sharon, 50 years of service. I had a long conversation with Sharon about her decision to, to step away at this time. Um, and, and, and we talked about a lot of history in Guilford. Uh, I also want to note that um, world language remains a shortage area in the state of Connecticut. So two incredibly experienced, effective, knowledgeable teachers um, and in a subject area that we know is a shortage area. So um, the high school will be challenged um, to fill the positions, let alone replace these individuals. Um, so can I um, uh, entertain a motion uh, to ratify the resignation of, um, of these two women? So moved. So moved. Okay, so Mr. Sands um, and then Mrs. Sullivan second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm looking at hands raised. 
All right, that is unanimous. Um, uh, next, please ratify the appointment of the following teachers. Jay Natali at Guilford High School as a literacy coach with nine to 10 years of experience and Jillian Bathrick at Adams Middle School as a literacy coach, eight years of experience. Dr. Freeman, do you, so these are our, our two literacy coaches that, that um, we're adding for next year. Yeah, so um, we felt incredibly fortunate with the quality of the pool that we drew when we approved these positions in the budget this year. Um, we mentioned to you that we were not totally confident that we would fill both of these positions. Um, mm -hmm. These two individuals come to us um, with exceptional experience, master teachers themselves, um, and we are very excited. The the search committee that Dr. Crystal pulled together included herself, representatives from the team of coaches, as well as administrators and teachers from both Adams and the high school who um, met and conducted these interviews collaboratively um, before ultimately Dr. Crystal and I decided where to assign these two individuals. Um, again, with, with what next year has in store for us, we are incredibly excited that we are completing math and, and literacy coaching K through eight. So Adams will have um, coaching in both of those subject areas, but also offering for the first time ever coaching, instructional coaching of any stripe at the high school. Um, next year is gonna be a challenging year. We are very excited to be bringing on these additional teacher supports. Uh, I will note that both of these fall within, if not um, below the salaries that we had budgeted for these positions. So incredibly excited about these two individuals enormously um, gratified that we did not have to lose these positions um, and that we'll have these teacher supports in place. Um, I know that Julia was part of that interview process. I know that Mike Regan was part of that interview process and Dr. Crystal led a great search finding two really talented um, to, to come in at the end and meet the, meet the candidates and, and be this impressed is, is nice. And, and to be able to lean on Dr. Crystal to run the whole process um, I really appreciated the team doing all the heavy lifting. I got to meet them at the very end and be very impressed and very pleased to offer them positions here in Guilford. Well, that, that's wonderful. So uh, certainly a thank you to Dr. Crystal um, and, and also for uh, the other administrators um, who are part of that. Um, so I would now like to entertain a motion to ratify the appointment of these two teachers. So move. So move. So move. Okay, do, uh, Dr. Best uh, uh, made the motion. Mrs. Rader seconded it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that is unanimous. Um, board agenda item 9.2 is to act on non renewal of non tenured teachers. Um, so we have uh, three that are on the non renewal list. Dr. Freeman, do you have anything to add about this? Yes, I do want to note that these non-renewals are occurring because of budget reductions and staffing reductions that occurred this year. Uh, the board has three names in front of you, and I just want to note that these are all three teachers in good standing who have performed well for us in the Guilford Public Schools. They will go on to be successful somewhere else. I know that at times the term non-renewal can be confused. Is it a performance? Is it financial? I want to make this absolutely clear. These are teachers in good standing who would be returning if we had positions available for them. Um, in fact, we had offered an early retirement incentive um, to make every effort to try to avoid this situation. These are layoffs because of reduced budgets. These are good teachers. Um, and I wish them all the best moving forward. They leave here with uh, glowing recommendations from their principals and I have every confidence that they will land on their feet uh, and be very successful and some other community is gonna be lucky to have them. All right, thank you. Um, so um, I will entertain a motion to act on the non-renewal of these three teachers. So moved. So moved. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Mrs. Sullivan uh, made the motion. Mr. Golino seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, that is unanimous. All right, so we are now um, up to section 10 of our agenda, reports of committee 10.1, the policy committee. Does the policy committee have a report tonight? 
No, we're due to meet uh, later in the month. Uh, so we'll have an update uh, for you then. Wonderful. Uh, operations committee, is there anything to add at this time about the operations committee meeting? Uh, yes, we had a productive meeting. Um, the uh, dining services people are continuing to do an excellent job of providing uh, a very large number of meals a day to uh, uh, students. And uh, we, uh, we had to transfer some money from other parts of the budget temporarily into that because we haven't received the reimbursement uh, for this. But I, I'd say on the whole, they're doing an excellent job there in dining services. Uh, we had a, a very good report and a detailed report from our healthcare consultant. Um, the interesting thing from that was we had asked them when we could expect the uh, virus related illnesses to show up in our uh, healthcare uh, claims. And it turns out that they haven't shown up yet, uh, primarily because the hospitals and the insurance companies hadn't worked out how the coding worked you know, what codes were gonna be used, et cetera, et cetera, what the guidelines were, what the reimbursement amounts were. And that's, you know, that's still being hassled out. So we don't really have a sense of that yet. Um, we were a little uh, surprised to see, and, and we don't have any indication whether any of the, there are 1,350 uh, people covered by our plan uh, we have no indication whether any of them has had a virus claim yet. But the consultant did warn us that these claims, if the person has to be hospitalized, can be up to $400,000 a person. Uh, now we have the uh, stop loss at 150, but it, it would, you know, so we'll see. I, I think it may be July or August till we get a real handle on that. Um, and that overall the, uh, uh, the costs uh, and expenses seem to be uh, uh, going pretty well. And the, the likelihood of us being able to deliver a surplus back to the uh, town of uh, 200,000 or maybe slightly more uh, looks uh, reasonable at this point. All right, thank you. Um, one, one of the things I do want to note uh, uh, in, in my other job, um, you know, one of the things that happens with any kind of medical billing is that there is a preset um, uh, distinction and number of codes that one can bill for. And um, not surprising, probably to anyone listening to this call, um, a brand new virus means that there were not codes available for. Yeah. Uh, physicians to code. Um, certainly, um, we hope that um, all of our employees and their families um, make it through um, through this time without uh, without contracting the virus. That is uh, certainly our hope. Um, as usual, we are uh, as we do every month. Um, we do monitor our um, healthcare claims um, to make sure that we are on top of. Um, uh, spending and, um, and, and that we are constantly have available to us uh, the funds that we will need. Um, Curriculum Instruction Assessment Committee, is there any report from that committee? Yes, um, actually we met in uh, May, May 26, I believe it was. Um, we had a very interesting discussion led by one of our world language um, teachers from the elementary school, very enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, and we got to see many videos of the actual curriculum that's being used um, that was delightful to watch, including our students and, and some parents in, involved. Um, 
we we learned about why uh, we have the um, the amount of time and and the number of days um, in uh, invested in world language, which relates to um, the state standards. Actually, so you know the hours that that we need um, for for state standards. Um, and also we learned about some movement in world language curriculum towards immersion, um, especially in the elementary school um, that has been working really well in the last couple of years uh, and got to see some of that in, in action through these videos that were shown. So it was, it was a very productive meeting um, and we did cap off by learning more about professional development that's been offered to the teachers this year. Unfortunately, um, as of March, uh, most of the much of the uh, professional development that was scheduled um, was not was not completed due to the COVID crisis and the and the um, distance move to distance learning. So uh, it was a, it was a good and productive meeting. Wonderful, thank you so much. And and I have to say, it was uh, the the presentation was so so enjoyable. It was a very engaging. Um, Ten point four, a liaison to town committees. Do we have any reports on town committee activity? Yes, um, the uh, pension committee. Every two years, the pension committee uh, reviews. Uh, the option to grant a cost of living adjustment. It's not a requirement under our pension agreements. And this year, uh, the pension committee met jointly with the uh, selectmen and uh, it was decided that uh, we would not grant a cost of living adjustment uh, at this time. Okay. Land acquisition has not met. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Land acquisition committee has not met. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Um, liaison to the Learn Board of Directors. Kristen, I don't know. Have they been meeting? We have been meeting. Yes. Um, we met just after our last public meeting. So this is a little bit of old news at this point. Our next meeting is this coming Thursday. Um, and in our last meeting, um, we as a collective group talked about graduation and no one had any plans or any really great ideas at that point. So we were all struggling the same way that, that this group has been to come up with what would really be a best practices, safe um, and fruitful way to help the kids graduate and honor what they've done. So that was something that our whole area really felt. Um, and then the other part that that was pretty sad and hard to hear. We, we had the executive director's review and she just kind of broke it up into pre-COVID and post-COVID. And they were just doing so great with their magnet schools pre-COVID and that group is struggling so, it's so difficult for these poor kids and parents and their teachers who can't access their students. These are some of our most um, severely challenged students who oftentimes had one-on-one -on -one support um, all day, every day, and now they don't. So it was it was heartbreaking to hear that. And and there was just, we just had no solutions. We had nothing to kind of offer in a way of help. So I really I really felt for her and for her whole team there. So hopefully, I don't know, we get some better news on Thursday. But it was it was tough to hear how much the kids and the parents are struggling. Thank you. Thank you for attending those meetings and, and reporting back to us. It's really helpful. Um, we are now at the, um, the part of the agenda, which is typically public questions. Um, again, because of uh, the nature of this Zoom meeting, um, I know there may be public listening um, through the YouTube link that we provided. Um, I again encourage folks um, to feel free to reach out to Dr. Freeman or Board of Ed members um, if you have um, comments, concerns, questions. Um, we um, are, um, are, are really open and, and uh, welcome any, um, anybody who reaches out to us. The last item on our agenda is an executive session. Um, this is an executive session for the Board of Ed to continue discussing um, the super superintendent's evaluation um, and his contract. Uh, so this is an item that will occur in executive session. 
uh, because as we come out of this executive session, there will be no further action and no votes tonight. Um, we will be ending this um, kind of Zoom call in its current form um, and ending the recording that streams um, through to YouTube for anyone attending um, the meeting in that fashion. Um, before we do that, um, is there anything else um, per things that have been on the agenda tonight that we need to attend to? Dr. Balistrizzi, I just want to confirm we'll be scheduling a special meeting for this Monday and we'll go ahead and begin posting that. I didn't hear any objection to scheduling that meeting. Great. Uh, no, you. right. So June 15th, Monday, June 15th, uh, the Board of Education will hold a special meeting. Um, we will post that agenda, um, but as Dr. Freeman already noted, um, certainly one of the things we'll be discussing um, is, um, is the mascot and, and race issues that have come um, to our attention through a, a great uh, number of people in our community and Guilford High School students and alumni. Thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna entertain a motion um, from um, a Board of Ed member to go into executive session. Um, as we do that, or after we do that, um, I believe uh, Kevin Mitchell will assist us in um, ending the regular meeting. Um, we thank everyone who has been present at this meeting tonight, uh, and um, we'll see you hopefully at the next meeting. So can I entertain a motion to go into executive session? I see Mrs. Sullivan's hand raised. Can I have a second? Mr. Del Ventura, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, so before we start talking,